I want to ask also, since we're in the UK, has the BBC had its day? Is it essentially over? What about the future of public broadcasting? Um, and if the BBC and public broadcasting organisations like the BBC still have a future, what is their future? How should they adapt to uh, this increasingly fluid and unpredictable environment in which we're all living? Um, just a side issue I want to ask our panelists, panelists is uh, what's your um, attitude to the uh, compulsory licence fee? Um, do we need it? Um, is it the price we pay for living in a, uh, an informed and democratic and responsible world? But I also want to um, challenge one of the main premises of media coverage this day, that there is indeed such a thing as impartiality. Because we talk about impartiality, objectivity, even-handedness, but is this a reality or is this just a fiction? I mean, does it introduce a false equivalence in debates, for example, about climate change, immigration, and nationalism? Now, the subject of foreign disinformation is highly topical these days, as you all know. But I sometimes wonder, do Western governments point out or highlight foreign disinformation merely to cover their own problems, to excuse the shortcomings of Western democracy, saying it's not our fault, it's the Russians or the Chinese or someone else who are at fault? What act actions also should governments and non-governmental organizations and societies take in response to such uh, problems, such threats? Now, we live in an era of social media. So <clears throat> what is the role of social media, of, of digital media in democratic societies? How far should such outlets be made accountable? What, what do you make of, say, for example, Facebook's decision that they will run political advertisements but without fact-checking procedures? I, just, I, I want to just briefly cover on, on gender issues, as, or refer to gender issues. Does the Western media apply a double standard to male and female politicians? And does this constrain the participation in public life of more women, as well as people from uh, ethnic, religious, and cultural minorities? And finally, and this is the bit, I want to uh, leave the big question, the really big question till last, how do you, how do the panelists and how do you here all see the media landscape and culture evolving over the next 10 years? I mean, will the distinction between free and controlled media become increasingly artificial? Anyway, that's enough of uh, me. Uh, Sylvie, would you like to open up with some uh, comments, please? Uh, thank you very much, Bobo. That's a lot of uh, questions <laughs> and then very important questions. Um, I'm not sure we will uh, uh, answer all of them, but you will probably help us to do to do this. Um, and thank you very much, Yena and Yura and Ina for bringing me here. It's always uh, um, a great pleasure to to be here among you and to to talk to you um, in this very important uh, endeavor that you are uh, involved in. Um, so I. You know, to, to put it simply, maybe, um, I started this job in another century and in another world. So it was a very simple world in a way. Uh, it was all black and white. Uh, there was the Soviet Union and the, Un and the West, and there was the, the evil and the good. <laughs> and there was uh, print media, TV, radio, and that was it. And so... Um, uh, you know, our job was was more simple because um, nobody really interfered with us. I mean, of course, a lot of 
power, you know, of, of agents of power were trying to prevent us from doing our job properly, but we knew more or less who they were, and and we, you know, we knew we knew where they came <laughs> from, and we knew how to fight. Um, now this is uh, a completely different different world, of course, geopolitically, but that's not an issue. Where, that's not the issue of our panel, but it's it's a factor, of course. Uh, uh, the, the world is much more complicated. And, and the media landscape is, of course, completely different. So papers like uh, Le Monde, where, where Nathalie uh, worked uh, for a long time also, and The Guardian and The New York Times and, you know, all these great newspapers uh, are being challenged uh, uh, from all from all sides. I mean, economically, their business model has completely collapsed, and their editorial model is also very much challenged by uh, the internet. And the the internet, when we started to use it on a daily basis, was blessing. It was something fantastic. In the I forgot when we really started to use it, uh, probably in the, the late 90s, early 2000, yeah. yeah, yeah. And um, so, you know, it was, as I say, a new world for, for journalists. It was a completely new way of doing your job. You had access to so many sources and uh, it was so open and it was there was so much information available everywhere. It was a dream, really. And... Um, then we realized that we were not the only one to have access to all this information. Our readers also had access to this information, so it was quite interesting because they started to challenge us because they had access to as much information as we had. So um, suddenly we were not the masters of knowledge, of information anymore. We had to be accountable. We were, you know, we had very educated people uh, or even non-educated people, but looking for, their, for, for this information on the web and saying, no, 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 this this is wrong you've got it wrong so that was another stage i would say and it was quite interesting because it was making our job more difficult but at the same time i think more productive and more um uh accurate probably and then came the the following stage which i think is the one we are in uh, and which is much more difficult which is the the stage of the social media and um there we are being challenged, and all this, all the time in the background, we were, and we are still fighting for a new business model to 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 make our companies, because you know these newspapers are private companies, and and so we have to make them survive. And I don't even dare to say be profitable because it's very difficult to bring a profit to nowadays for a newspaper, but at least to be even, to survive. So um, that's that's on the business side. But on the editorial side, we have now, um, uh, we are now doing journalism in a world where we are not, you know, where anybody, and maybe this is something we, we will talk about in more in details, but anybody can say, I am a journalist. Um, uh, but without having to apply rules that we apply to ourselves, because we have uh, ethics codes, we have rules, we have uh, uh, a technical way of exercising our job, and, you know, anybody can say I'm a journalist and, you know, be free of all those rules. So that's, uh, that's a big challenge because the uh, citizens and the readers don't necessarily know how to determine who is a journalist and who is not and who to believe and who to trust. And this uh, question of trust is, um, I think we are going to talk about it a lot to, this morning because this issue of trust is really at the heart of our problems today. Um, we had, I had, there's a French daily uh, La Croix, it's, a, it's actually a Catholic daily, but it's a general news um, daily, it's a very good paper. Uh, and they every year they do this um, poll and study of uh, the attitude of the public towards media. And it was just published uh, uh, two weeks ago, the, the, uh, their study of, of this year. And it's pretty alarming, their, their, their conclusions and their statistics are pretty alarming. Um, they realized that 
the French public is not interested in news anymore. <laughs> so that's the end. Of, you know, that's the death of our job. If people are not interested in news, um, they um, I think only fifty nine percent. Uh, no, 59% of French uh, people say they are not interested in news. Uh, the credibility of the media is uh, very low still. I mean, the good news is that the, tra the credibility of the... Tr so trust in the traditional media like newspapers is going up slightly and the credibility of the web media is going down. 71% of the people think that the media don't cover issues that really matter to them. So it's, that's, that's an, a very uh, interesting finding also. It answers to one of your questions maybe. Uh, yeah. Um, so people, you know, feel are not connected to what you, we do because they think we are not addressing the issues that are really important to them. And that was uh, something which was pretty striking during the crisis of the Gilets jaunes, the Yellow Vest, last year. Um, so it's, and also um, the majority of readers think that journalists are not independent, that they are not independent from political power. Let me see. Yeah, 68% of the people think that the journalists are subject to pressure from political parties and from the government and you know not don't resist and 61 percent think that they are um, under pressure from money that they are not independent from money from finance you know power financial power so this is a pretty bleak picture that we are uh, against um, now about uh, Quickly about social media, um, there's a kind of schizophrenia also because people now realize that they don't really, they cannot really trust social media. Um, but that's where most of them get their news from. So you know, it's um, particularly in the young generation. Most, uh, the majority of the young people get their news from from social media, and and in I don't know if it's all over Europe. I think so. But Facebook in 2018 decided to change its algorithm and uh, to sh uh, give priority to news shared among friends or communities rather than shared among media. So um, this is another thing that we have noticed was very effective, for instance, during the Gilets jaunes protest, that um, because you have all these anger groups or groups, you know, and people share their news and the algorithm puts it uh, ahead of the news uh, um, distributed by the media, you know, this is, this is really uh, um, a way of spreading fake news uh, much more effectively. So fake news, of course, is, is, is a real challenge for, for us and for the democratic system in general, for the way democracy works. Uh, fake news and their instrumentalization by politicians, by commentators, um, and, you know, if, if facts, facts are debased uh, and without a common understanding of, uh, of reality, reason debate cannot uh, be possible. It becomes impossible to have a rational debate if you are not talking about the same reality. And this is what I have seen emerging in, in the United States um, you know, during the camp, mostly during the, the campaign of 2016, uh, and Donald Trump was really pushing heavily, and his campaign was was very active in this. And but and and he had, you know, you had two parallel universes of facts and reality. You have some media who, who talk about one thing, and other media who talk about a different. Uh, version of that thing, and so it's um, it's extremely difficult to debate. And and I, I, unfortunately, and I was watching this in the United States, and I thought, fortunately, in Europe we don't really have this <laughs> yet. And I think now we have it. Yeah. Um, 
because pop, you know the wave of pop populism has spread and we are all um, in a different way and, and the different forms in, in, in our democracies challenged by this populist trend. And so we are all now struggling with these uh, parallel worlds of, uh, of the alternative facts or alternative reality. It's very tricky and it's very difficult to, to you know, if you debate with somebody and you're not talking about the same uh, reality, how do you uh, debate, uh, you know, and debate and fact-based information are just essential pillars of the democratic work. You know, it's very difficult in parliament, in 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 public debate, in if you don't have those that fact-based information as a basis, it's very, very difficult to have a real political uh, debate. So uh, maybe I'll stop there. It's, uh, you know, it's trying, you know, the bottom line is that trying to rebuild trust uh, is an uphill battle for, for the media. But, and, and again, just to answer you, your first question, I think, I don't think it's all, you know, uh, the media are not responsible for for everything. I'm not trying to uh, whitewash what we do, but um, uh, the media, you know, medium, media are intermediary. We 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 mediate. We are we are very important. I think we are. Our role is crucial, but um, uh, th th there are all, all, a lot of other factors for for this polarization and populism uh, trend. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sylvie. I want to um, ask a couple of follow-up questions, if I may. Now, I'm really interested in uh, this, these figures from uh, La Croix here. And you say that, for example, that 59% of French people are not interested in news. But that immediately prompts the question, are they not interested in news, or is the problem that they're not interested in the way that news has traditionally been presented, or is being presented to them? Um, because <laughs> at the risk of beating up on the BBC, when I when I look at this, the, the main t uh, news bulletin, so for the BBC it's at 6 o'clock and 10 o'clock in the evening, uh, for Channel 4 it's 7, um, and, and for ITV, it's a 6.30, whatever. But I find, for example, when I'm listening to BB, the BBC News, that it's so bland because they're trying so hard to be so-called objective, mm -hmm. impartial, even-handed. So they present news in, a, in the most – a lot of news items in the most uninteresting way. If there's even the sniff of controversy mm – -hmm then their, 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 their natural instinct is to play safe. Mm -hmm. Whereas, say, Channel 4 is because partly because the news bulletin is twice as long, it's an hour instead of half an hour, they're prepared to, to make judgments. They're prepared to have debates there. So already you feel whether you agree or disagree with the views being expressed, at least they're out there and you can f feel engaged at some level. Whereas the, it, sometimes it seems to me that the BBC gives you very few opportunities to do that. So when 59% of people say, I mean, I know we're talking about Britain rather than France here, but when they say they're not interested in the news, or frankly, I'm almost in that 59% if it were in the UK, because I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, my God, that's boring. Yeah. You know, how, how to make it interesting, how to, how to stimulate my thinking. So, well, that's a very good question. <laughs> I'm not sure I have the answers. I'm sure Natalie will have them. Um, um, well, there's, there are several things in what you said. First, the TV, it's true that they have to fill a void, yeah. right? And uh, I mean, they have to, f not a void, but they have to fill up the time. And so uh, this issue of the commentators, I think people are pretty tired of this. We have to, uh, we have on, on those all news channels, um, uh, you know, they have to get people to talk. Yeah. And not all of them are 
uh, <laughs> are either informed or have interesting things to say. So um, I think this is an issue. People are getting bored with this. And then, you know, I know that in on French uh, all news channels, they like to get people who fight. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, the, the priority is not given to people who have interesting things to say or who have done their homework and, you know, will bring something new or, uh, or interesting analysis, but those who will have a very, um, um, how do you say, um, sharp uh, point of view and, you know, who will um, provoke controversies and, you know, and so that's, I think that's, a, that has a terrible effect on, on public yeah. debate, actually. Yeah. Um, another thing is, uh, and another problem is the choice of issues we cover. And I think that's also why people say they are not interested in the news. It's because we sometimes focus on issues that, you know, people don't care so much Uh, about or such as they, what? Well, that's for instance in this uh, poll, it's very interesting because there people were asked, "What do you think of the media uh, coverage of?" And they give a list of big events in France. Mm -hmm. So, uh, was it uh, covered properly, or, or was it uh, done uh, uh, not in the right way? So, for instance, uh, Jacques Chirac's death. That was a huge <laughs> thing. And apparently people approved that, you know, they said, yes, it was justified that there was a lot of coverage. The um, fire of Notre Dame de Paris, um, you know, that was interesting. And they did, they think we did too much. Really? Yeah. And that's wow. interesting that's because, interesting. yeah, because... Uh, I think everybody was moved and shocked. It was a very important event. Mm. But then, you know, okay, it's a fire. It's an accident. Um, it's not a terrorist attack. It's not, nobody's be responsible for it. Maybe we'll probably find that, you know, there's an investigation, so you will probably find that there were some mistakes made by the workers or the, or the company which did that, I don't know. But it's not, you know, these are not, I would call natural disasters. Nobody died. And um, so, yes, on the day itself, it was a huge shock. The pictures were extraordinary mm -hmm. and people were extremely moved. That's, that's genuine. Yeah. And it raised a few questions about our attachment to cult, you know, to the, to the national uh, history and religion and culture and blah, blah. Um, but then that went on for days and days and you had a lot of people commenting and saying, you know, totally uninteresting things about Notre Dame de Paris and the religion. And, so and I think that there the public saw that it was, you know, the world was going on and the country was going on during that time and they, were re they had to um, lead their daily lives with their daily problems and these were completely forgotten. So that, that's maybe an example. What were some of the other issues that they, uh, uh, I'm just out of interest, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, particularly of, w were people interested in international issues or they, th they yeah. were very much focused yeah, on? Yeah, Brexit, for instance. <laughs> yeah. uh, Brexit, Did they think there was yeah, too much coverage? Not, too, not enough. Not enough or, coverage? Or not, not the proper way, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, um, European election also, they say it was not well well covered. Uh, so they wanted more coverage of the European or different, elections. Yeah, or, or different, different, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Greta, Greta Thunberg's speech at UN on, on climate was also criticized. Uh, and, what um, was the problem there? Was I it, don't know. I'm, I'm yeah, afraid yeah, they, they, they don't they specify it. Yeah. They say they, it, it was not um, covered enough. Okay. Yeah. Um, Gilets jaunes, too much. Yeah. <laughs> We, the media did too much about the gilets jaunes, and that's also an interesting thing because the media, particularly TV, of course, focused on the violence, and that was um, that was very striking. You know, of course, it was a violent protest, but you know how TV works. It's you have one riot somewhere, and maybe 80% of the rest of the protest is quiet, but all you will see on TV is this particular riot because it's extremely spectacular and there was a lot of criticism and there's one last thing one example which is interesting I think it's a, it's a French story it's a, it's a guy who killed his family mm. uh, two years ago I think uh, he killed uh, he, he was a well-to-do man you know a, a, a 
pretty well-to-do family in a nice house somewhere in France. Xavier Ligonnet, you remember? No, maybe you weren't. <laughs> uh, Xavier Dupont de Ligonnès. And he killed his uh, children and his wife and disappeared. Mm -hmm. And he completely disappeared. He was never to be seen again. So, well, you know, again, yeah. things happen. You know? <laughs> uh, it's sad, but okay. So suddenly um, came a, a news from England, I think, that he had been arrested. Uh, in England, or at you know at some yeah. border, maybe at uh, trying to take a ferry, I forgot. And the French media got completely crazy about this, and for three days it was all <laughs> all about Xavier Dupont de Ligonnès. It was it him or wasn't he? And it was it ended up that it was a mistake, so it was not him. So, um, but you know, we went hysterical. Not not yeah. my newspaper, I must say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, we almost did. You, we were lucky because uh, we found out the truth at deadline time, so we had time to yeah. correct and you know uh, make everything disappear. But um, otherwise, I think we would have fallen into the trap also. Uh, but you know, people saw very clearly that this, you know, this is irrelevant. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> coming back to this theme of uh, people not interested in news uh, or, or in feeling that uh, coverage of certain issues is too much, too little, too hysterical. You know, I wonder whether uh, w people in the media, not just journalists, but proprietors, uh, politicians, whether they actually underestimate the intelligence of the public. So they, they look at a figure and they say, People are not interested in news, when the reality is people are increasingly critical of the way news is presented. And for example, there are programs, and there'd be programs in, in Russia, in Ukraine, in France, in, 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 in the UK, where you do set sides against each other. And so essentially, you, the, the, the editorial decision is made that the public is not interested in a calm, reasoned debate. They want theatre. Mm -hmm. and, and to hell with the news, to hell with any idea of objective analysis. So, and yet the, the, what you're talking about here, it seems to me that people are objecting not so much to too much news, but to the almost cheapening of the news. So we are dumbing down when the public actually want us to improve our, the quality of our coverage. So I wanted to ask you about that. Yeah, that's what it seems. And it's, in a way, it's an encouraging finding. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I... I it's difficult because when you look at, uh, we all have now in our websites what is the most read article, yeah, and yeah, that's yeah. that's a bit difficult for journalists <laughs> because uh, you know it's not always the best, uh, well, best researched uh, or best investigated articles which are the most popular, of course. So uh, um, we all often joke about this among uh, with our colleagues that you know it's better to do a, a story about sex or animals and then you'll be in the most read so this is also a criteria that if you look i look at the bbc website very often um, and their most popular stories are always stories about sex yeah right yeah. so um, you know I think that you have those two trends that you have to work with, that people, yes, expect us to treat um, real serious issues which affect their daily lives, um, but they also want some light stuff. Yeah. So, sure. you know, <laughs> it's a balance. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Natalie, uh, uh, can I come to you and uh, uh, to, to try and address some of those questions? I, I admit they're such huge questions and there are no ready answers, but um, I'd, I'd, I'd be very interested in your take on it. I think Bobo and Sylvie uh, had um, a, a very, very rich uh, conversation just now. And maybe uh, I wanted to share, and I agree with everything that Sylvie said, uh, uh, maybe I, what I could share with you and um, would be useful uh, to add um, to, to this 
is that, uh, as Sylvie started by saying, uh, uh, our journalistic world, our information world has completely changed in, uh, in the last 20 years, I would say. And uh, I personally, um, you know, Sylvie mentioned fake news, uh, 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 the difficulty of uh, even having a, a, a notion of, uh, of established uh, agreed facts. Uh, um, I, I, I find myself, I'm 50, I'm going to be 54 years old this year, and I've been, this year I will have been working in journalism for 30 years. I started, uh, my first job in journalism, I started in 1990 in Paris at, uh, Libération, a French newspaper. And uh, what I did is I went to Central, e Central and Eastern Europe uh, because the Berlin Wall uh, had fallen. And I, these were my first steps in journalism. I was reporting uh, from uh, Central and Eastern Europe. I was a beginner. I had no experience. Uh, Sylvie was a, more est a very established uh, journalist uh, 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 because she became established faster than I did. <laughs> uh, and Sylvie also covered all the revolutions in, in 1989. And of course, this uh, transformation in Europe Again, our common space um, was very much about freedom of expression, uh, freedom of the press. Uh, and um, it, at the time, it seemed to me that journalism was about collecting, collecting um, stories from people, writing them, and then sending them, and they would be in a newspaper, and people would read it and they would believe me, and uh, I would have an impact on society. And, if, and later I covered less, less positive events, like war in uh, Chechnya, or uh, some uh, tensions, uh, things, I went to Afghanistan also. So some, later I thought, or I also, I also wrote about human rights issues, um, and later I thought, well, if I C collect this information, these stories, put them in an article, put them in a newspaper, people will read them and they will react, you know, they will, they will react, they will agree with me that this is scandalous, that this must stop, and I will have an impact. And we know today we are living in a completely different world from that. It doesn't mean that these, um, this impact cannot exist, but it's, it's not at all guaranteed because the quality established media are no are not uh, no longer the gatekeepers we are no longer the gatekeepers which means that uh, we are um, in uh, de facto in a competition with many many other sources many many other sources and i'm sure you when you consume when we use this word now consume news to consume news like food uh, when you consume news i'm sure you have i would be interested to hear from you how you consume news but i'm sure you have a multitude of sources and uh, are you sure that when you consume news probably a lot of it's online are you sure that you can trust or are you sure that you identify what the source is and this is a question that as citizens we have to ask ourselves all the time and um, and as journalists it's a fundamental transformation of the environment in which we we work and I started asking myself more recently very basic questions about what is the job of a journalist. I, I thought I would never ask myself these questions. I thought, I, tw I thought it was obvious. But now I'm really asking, trying to ask these questions more deeply. And, um, uh, you know, even the word journalism, where, where does it come from? And uh, I, I found that it, it comes from uh, uh, after the French Revolution. It's, it comes from journal, and it's a French word. Journalism comes from French. And uh, it appeared after the French Revolution. Uh, yes. And, um, and, uh, and then I, I looked at... Um, and, and journalism, by the way, only really appeared in our societies in the, so, you know, 18th, but especially the 19th century. It coincides with, uh, you know, the Industrial, the industrial Revolution, uh, um, a transformation of our political scenes. And then, of course, we had other media, uh, new media, radio, television in the 20th century, radio used by totalitarian systems 
to impact a massive amount of, of, of people, to impact their minds. And I looked at the definition of journalism in, in, the Ox or in Oxford. So I looked in the Oxford Dictionary and the definition of, okay, I'm sure there's a richer definition somewhere, but the core definition of the Oxford Dictionary, I find it very frustrating. It, I will read it to you. <laughs> The journalism, the activity or profession of writing for newspapers, magazines, or news websites, or preparing news to be broadcast. Now, for me, that says nothing, because anybody, anybody can broadcast anything today, right? Anything, anybody. So the, the real question in this definition is, what is news? You know, and then you enter another, another. It's like you know, uh, uh, Alice in Wonderland. You're constantly going down a, a, a rabbit hole. Um, so. I, I'm just sharing this. Uh, I'm, I'm asking myself all these questions about journalism, and uh, and also I'm looking at cl more closely about uh, how our media our media work. And I think as journalists, what is happening is that many journalists are asking much more deeply the question of um, how do we relate to our readers? How do we actually think about our readers? About how they how they uh, perceive our work? How they receive our work? We have we are having to think much more. More deeply about this relationship. And finally, as, as uh, a brief remark, um, I think, um, again, to probably under, underline what Sylvie uh, said about this importance of, uh, of a, commonly, a commonly agreed body of facts. Um, why do we need journalism? Uh, we need journalism because without that common commonly, generally agreed body of facts, established facts, you cannot have democratic policy making. You cannot have democratic uh, political life in a, in a society. Um, and my, my uh, definition of, of journalism is, is um, I'm, I'm, I didn't invent it. I, I, I heard it from somebody, and I decided this is this is my definition of journalism. And my definition of journalism is it is um, the honest, uh, the, the 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 best possible, and most honest uh, description of events using the uh, available amount of information that you can collect at a given time, at a given time. Because uh, often journalists are described like the historians of the, of the present. The historians of the present. I, he I heard this formula when I was in journalism school. We are the historians of the present. But that's not really true. Because the historians have access to archives when they really work, you know, they, they have access to archives, they can have access to uh, documents that, that people didn't know, uh, did, could not access at the time. Journalists work differently because they don't have access to the documents or to the communication between governments or, you know, they, they don't on a daily basis, they don't. So they have to work in a very uncertain uh, context, but they, the important thing is that they have to work honestly and try to collect the best possible description of events and do that honestly on the basis of what they can what they can obtain as information from people, from being witnesses, from seeing and reading things, and um, so that's that's my definition. And the and um, we know uh, that there are countries where the freedom of uh, the press is completely uh, repressed. Uh, there are variations in the degrees. I believe Russia is a country where the freedom of the press is repressed. We can perhaps discuss that. And I think that one of the basic fundamental rules that we all have in, in this wide space of Europe, uh, which uh, uh, the institution uh, that I want to refer here to is the Council of Europe, um, and Russia is a member of the Council of Europe, uh, um, and this the Council of Europe has um, has a, a convention. I think it's it's the it's the European Convention on Human Rights, and and this includes the notion of freedom of expression and freedom of information. And the Council of Europe last year last year um, for the first time in a report said that 
uh, freedom of information in Europe, in the, in the large space, but also in Western and, you know, uh, member states of the EU. Uh, freedom of uh, information and, uh, is uh, under threat as never before since the end of the Cold War. And one of the things this refers to is um, uh, the fact that some journalists have been assassinated in European countries, uh, uh, Jan Kuciak in uh, Slovakia in February 2018, uh, Daphne uh, uh, Karana uh, Galicia in Malta in 2017. And uh, there are countries, Poland, uh, Hungary, where the government uh, acts uh, very intensively to repress freedom of, of, of the media. And so we are, we are on top of everything uh, else. We are uh, in, a, in a technological transformation, technological revolution, big questioning about how democracies function and big, big questions among journalists. And I'm happy to discuss more. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Natalie. Um, so my, my first question to you is you recognized uh, as, as Sylvie has as well that we the journalists quality journalists are operating in a much more competitive uh, mass news mass information mass outlet environment so how do you make the difference how do you not raise yourself above the fray but how do you communicate news or analysis in an environment where pe there's very, very limited bandwidth for you. So how do you, how do you make your stories make the difference? So that someone reading or listening to you says, ah, yes, you know, that's Natalie Nougarhead. Yeah, I, uh, I know I can listen or read something that's really worth uh, learning about, as opposed to these hundred other journalists or stories that have appeared on the same subject on the same day. How do you make the difference? You know, actually, I mean, I, 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 right now I don't see it as this kind of personal, um, I mean, I shared my doubts uh, yeah. about how we approach the, the job, mm -hmm. but I, I don't see this as a personal thing. I mean, sure. um, but I, I, I really see it, but you're right, the question is a really, really good one because, you know, collect as journalists, how do we think about um, really uh, con conveying something important to our readers who are citizens and, and to play our role in democracy? So how, how do we think about that? Yeah. And um, uh, I, I think we are... Um, I think we are only the beginning of that conversation, actually, and I think we are only the beginning still at the technological tsunami that is hap that is going to happen to us. Um, and so you asked the question, you know, how do we see the, the future of, of journalism and media in 10 years? It's a really hard question. And, uh, you know, I, I hope that uh, quality journalism and quality media organizations will, will, will survive. I think quality journalism will survive because, again, uh, I believe democracy will survive. Um, How but, will but I, I'm, I'm not sure survive? quality traditional media organizations will survive. Yeah. I, think, I think it's possible that we're going to be in, in a completely different fragmented okay. way uh, system with flows all over the place and in, uh, media institutions maybe will, will not be s as they are today. Um, but the question of how do you convey um, things to, to the public means, and it's a fundamental question, means that I think in journalism schools now, we should be teaching psychology, yeah. anthropology. <laughs> we should not just be, I mean, yeah. history, I think, is the most important thing to teach in a, in a journalism school and philosophy, um, <coughs> critical thinking, which is what we're all here for. Um, but also sociology, anthropology, and, and, and also how, how, how the uh, algorithms 
like almost like you know uh, me the medical the physical impact of algorithms or or screens on our minds mm -hmm. how does that work how does that work the other day so i heard somebody say that the algorithms that we have in our on our phones and on our social media um, you know they they are they are designed to make us addicted they are like uh, they they have special formulas that make you always want to go back to your phone like a hundred times a day. They they are specially designed by a digital scientist for this. So how does that work? And I I, I somebody said they have they are designed to make you like an a drug a, a, an a, addicted, just like uh, cocaine acts on your. If you take cocaine, it acts on your brain the same way that some digital alg algorithms work. So you know. All these things we have to become much more aware of, and we don't know much. We're still learning all these things. Yeah. And I think that also has to be part of thinking about journalism. So it takes us in completely different fields from the ones that we've been used to. Yeah, uh, yeah that's a very important question that Natalie uh, just raised. And what I wanted to point out also is how there's an evolution now in the public attitude about regulation mm. of social media and of the internet. You know, internet was conceived as a totally free, yeah. I don't know what to call it, a concept or instrument, or it was a totally free environment. It was really all about freedom. and no good. It was good. Yes, yeah. it was a force for good, don't do evil, you know, <laughs> that's Google. And, um, uh, and at the beginning it was, I must say, it was, you know, fantastic. And um, so there was no perception that it could be used for evil or for yeah. negative uh, purposes. And now I think the perception of the public and of uh, politicians and journalists, of course, media, people in the media, is that it has to be, I mean, control is a, is a negative word, maybe, but regulated. There has to be a framework. There has to be some kind of governance and regulation so that, um, you know, you cannot do what you just described about the alcoholisms and, and make people completely addicted and, you know, and, and, and use your data also in a way that nobody controls except those companies. So uh, I think this is a very important trend at the moment. Um, uh, uh, and a political trend that we have to go um, towards regulation. And it's yeah. difficult to, you know, it's a very difficult thing to do. How do you regulate Google? How do you regulate Facebook or Instagram or all those social media? Uh, and how do you regulate algorithm? And then now we have al um, artificial intelligence, so it is uh, completely an another challenge. But it's, it's really something important, I think, which is going on at the moment about this, yeah. <laughs> That's that's a very interesting insight I, because it brings to brings us back to one of the central questions for me, which is trying to balance quality but also timeliness and relevance. And I mean, Natalie, you 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 put as your definition of journalism, the, if I understand correctly, the best possible and honest description of events on the basis of available facts. Yes. Is, that, is that fair? Well, here's the problem. Available information. Yes. Available yes. information. Yeah. Here's the problem from my perspective. I see very often we don't know what the facts are, what the information is. We operate on the basis of very little information, and yet journalists are under constant pressure to come up with the story, their editor, that there'll be there'll be a uh, a news item, and the, won't the editor say to you, "Look, we have to do a story on X or Y," and the reality is you don't really have the information available. So you write something, or you you do a, a, a an item uh, on on the TV news, and people can see that you don't necessarily have all the information. You're just coming up with a reportage and then the next news bulletin, it appears again. And there's not necessarily that much information accessible to you and yet you still have to deliver the product for the consumer. And people say, well, you know, 
it's they're either the journalist is either guessing or they're descending into sort of cliches and platitudes and they don't really know anything and it's such a sort of a bromide of a story so how do you how do you address that that tension yeah. and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about um, uh, uh, I work at the Guardian and I'll tell you a little bit about uh, how we some of the things that have changed in, really in the last literally two three years about how we how we think about this question what choices do we make how many articles do we put online at what rhythm uh, um, etc and um, uh, and this this points to a fact which is that the mission of journalism is the one that I, you know, that we've heard, a very noble mission in democracy, but also journalism is a business, right? It's uh, media organizations uh, or, or businesses, uh, uh, private ones, uh, um, uh, and that's a big question, it's a big issue to debate. Um, and so, as Sylvie mentioned also, media organizations are struggling to uh, build a new business model in the new environment. At The Guardian, which is one of the newspapers, uh, The Guardian was created, by the way, in uh, 1821. So next year it is celebrating its 200 years. Um, and it's, it's a newspaper that was born with the Industrial Revolution in the north of England, in Manchester. Uh, I'll, I'll take one minute to tell you the story because I think the origin of newspapers is very important. How were they created? You know, when you look at the media organizations and the newspapers in your country, do you know the story of these newspapers? You know, do you know how Izvestia was created? But these are interesting things, or maybe you don't read Izvestia, but it's interesting to know where, how the story of a media organization. And the Guardian, in the Guardian, um, uh, in uh, in uh, 1821 in Manchester. It was the beginning of um, textile, uh, uh, not factories, but small shops, you know, textile fabrics. Um, and um, there was a, a strike because workers were exploited. And uh, there was a demonstration and the police opened fire on the demonstrators. And I think around 10 people were killed. It's called the Peterloo Massacre. And some uh, local um, small, small medium-sized businessmen, uh, early, the early bourgeois, if you like, of the Industrial Revolution, were shocked by this. And they said, you know, this cannot happen in our city. And they said, we need a newspaper to be able to, you know, describe and denounce this and de have debates. And so it didn't happen immediately, but th they created the Guardian. And um, they were, by the way, uh, non-conformist Protestants. So they were not Anglican like the, the, the power in, in, in London, in Westminster. Uh, you know, there's, um, they, were, they were slightly marginal Protestants. And so it, this gave them an identity which made them want to be like a counter, a counterbalance to the central political power. So it's a very independent uh, newspaper from the beginning, from central power. And they created this newspaper, and it was just one one piece of paper, you know, to start with, uh, just one page. Um, and uh, almost 200 years later, it's it's one of the big global media organizations, of course, benefiting from. Sorry. Uh, benefiting, of course, from the English language and from the fact that it is free online. You know, if you read it uh, on online, you know it's for free. Uh, and it, w the Guardian today has about 170 million unique browsers per month, meaning that every month uh, there's a, a unique browser, uh, meaning a person or a computer or so a smartphone that clicks at least once on the Guardian. 170 million people every month, that's the estimation, uh, click on Guardian content. So it's, it's got huge reach. Going to the question of the business model and your question, yeah. sorry for being no, no, a bit no, long. No, really um, for uh, the Guardian was one of the first media organizations in in the West, I think, to embrace the technological revolution. So, uh, Alan Rusbridger, who is a principal in a college here in Oxford today, the the, the editor in chief at the time. 
uh, loved gadgets, loved technology, and he took the decision very early, uh, in the early mid-90s, that The Guardian would be at the forefront of the digital revolution. Um, and the strategy for a long time was, we will grow our audience. The, we are on, online, we will be able to have readers everywhere in the world, not just in Britain, ev not just in Europe, everywhere in the world. And we will grow and uh, build our newsroom, we will have a team in the US, we will build Guardian USA, we will build Guardian Australia for the Asia uh, time zone. And we will have a global news organization, almost like a Empire 2.0. <laughs> and when I tell my British friends this at the, at, the, at the newspaper, you have actually built Empire 2.0 in the era of Brexit. You know, you've like, they, they don't like it. They don't like me to say this, but... Um, and uh, of course the strategy, the business strategy was you grow your audience and then you get advertising revenue. Yeah. So you grow your audience to maybe 200 million, 250 million people in the world. And then you can go to companies, you know, L'Oréal, uh, Ford, whatever, uh, and, uh, you know, EasyJet, and you can say, okay, we have this huge audience. You, if you want to advertise on our website, on our screens, this is the price. This model, which was uh, very, uh, it was very smartly uh, built, collapsed in 2015-2016. Why? Uh, because as for every other media organization in the world that had uh, this uh, strategy of advertise, uh, cap capturing advertisement, uh, we lost a huge amount of our online online advertising because. All these companies who were doing online advertising suddenly, like a like a group of sheep, they moved to Facebook and Google, like in a massive way. And why? Because of course Facebook has what two billion two billion people, right? I think more than two billion. So we even by being so powerful and so big, like you know, 170 million unique browsers per month, we were not in a position to compete with the massive phenomenon of Facebook and Google. So we have been rethinking the model, and the model now is about engagement. It's not about the number of clicks. Of course, the number of clicks matters. It's, uh, but the, the model is engagement, so you will focus on the relationship with the reader. You want your readers to be loyal and to come frequently, not just once a month, because the statistic I gave you of 170 million, is it's enough to click once a month and you are a unique browser, right? So you, we, we want people to be coming almost every day to think that we are part of their lives, that they are loyal to us, that they can trust us, and so we are uh, building like literally data analytics and a new way of choosing how we how we present stories, which stories, and we we, we decide to, to to look into. So to go find uh, two seconds more on your question, it means that before I think, and I'm probably simplifying, but to make it kind of understandable, the before we would have on the website regular. Uh, changes of headlines, you know. Yeah, yeah. Perhaps the story, once you click on the story, it wasn't very different from what it was, mm -hmm. you know, an hour before. Maybe there was just like one sentence changed. Yeah, yeah. But the headline changed slightly, so it would attract another click. Now I think there's less of an obsession about that. Yeah. But the, fundament the, fundamentals of, the fundamentals of the job remain the same. You know, we want everything that we send out online to be quality that's uh, you know it's not it's not always perfect for sure but we want we want it to be quality yeah. no that's extremely interesting Nathalie. but i you say that the 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 current guardian model is engagement rather than the number of clicks and engagement implies the idea of 
a little bit advocacy. And one of the, the things that the Guardian newspaper is famous for is its position in, com uh, in combating climate change, in, in raising awareness about climate change issues. And yet in your travel supplements, and this is where the commercial pressures come in, you have these enormous spread advertisements for uh, Antarctic cruises. <laughs> And so how does the Guardian, how does a quality newspaper, again, balance a kind of moral stance on a critical issue, the critical issue, in my opinion, of climate change, and yet it needs the funding from the advertisers? How do you square that circle? No, no. I mean, I, I actually hadn't. I actually, I, 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 thought you were. Yeah, Arctic cruises or other cruises. Um, this is like it's. This is actually a question that I remember we dealt with at Le Monde. Also, you know, how do you come? How do you? Um, how do you articulate your need for advertising revenue with um, with uh, respecting your 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 fundamental values and. Um, so I don't think it's hypocrisy. I don't think it's like, uh, you know, I think it's uh, clumsiness right there. If I had to say one, I think it's clumsiness, and I think it's that this, um, you know, because of the climate issue, we, it's the other revolution we are in, all of us. It's like we will, in the next 10 years, we will all of us have to be thinking very hard about how we change our economies and our lives to fit this. this ch and so I think... It's happening also within media organizations. Like, for example, I, you know, I don't go on cruises to the Arctic, but but I, I take a lot of planes. And just recently, you know, and I, I was never an obsessed person with climate issues, and I, re I respect people who worry deeply about it. But I was more on human rights. But that's my personal, you know, um, interest or curiosity. It was always about human rights, actually. But I respect people who are who are very motivated by the climate issue. But recently, even me. Who who wasn't never really sort of, you know, obsessed with it. I, I started thinking about taking the train more in Europe. So I, I often go to Berlin, and and now I'm thinking about taking the train more. Uh, so not cruises, but trains. Okay. Yeah. okay.